Hey everyone, welcome to this year's summit. Uh, joining us again from last year is uh, Patrick Ferenga, who was uh, one of the most watched videos of last year. I'd be uh, happy to tell you, Pat. Welcome again, coming back for 2020. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, Daniel. So, Pat, for those people that didn't join us last year and are perhaps joining us this year for the first time uh, to learn about homeschooling and um, alternative education, to use uh, mm -hmm. air quotes, um, could you just uh, give people um, like a quick um, background and uh, the work you do? Sure. Um, I run uh, Holt GWS, which um, was founded by John Holt, uh, a teacher and author, uh, who, to make a long story short, um, it, it, over the course of his life, he went from being a school reformer, uh, advocating for more self-directed learning for children in the classroom, to eventually realizing that's not going to happen, to you know, supporting homeschooling. And he was one of the first, if not the first, um, educator to come out and formally support homeschooling and started a magazine called Growing Without Schooling, which uh, after he died in 1984, I continued to publish until 1991. Homeschooled, unschooled is what John Holt came up with because he didn't want people to think that you, you turn your home into a school. That was the last thing he wanted anybody to do. <laughs> so he came up with the phrase unschooling uh, because it's learning that doesn't have to take place in school or at home and it doesn't have to look like school learning. And um, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, we've home, uh, homeschooled or unschooled our three daughters. They're all grown women now. Uh, they work. They're doing very well, um, and many of the families that I've you know been in touch with over the years, I hear from them online and stuff, and their children tend to be doing very well. So, you know, I, I've got a lot of a lot of experience, um, you know, from the very source of the movement, so we say. You know, I've been there since the beginning. John started the magazine in 1977, and I came on in 1981. Yeah, that's, um, and I urge anybody that's here new this year to go back and watch uh, Pat's interview last year because we did a deep dive into the history of homeschooling or unschooling and mm -hmm. um, John's work, who I think it's safe to say Pat was, you know, one of the, I mean, founders, would you say founder? How would you explain? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's often referred to as one of the founders of the modern homeschooling movement, absolutely. Excellent. So throughout your work, Pat, you've been doing this, um, you know, I, I don't want to uh, give away your age here, but uh, for <laughs> many, many decades, yes. <laughs> you've seen a lot of changes and you've, you know, you, you've been there and you've fought the fight and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you've beat the drum for homeschooling. And mm -hmm. here we are now um, at time of recording, we're, we're hopefully coming towards the end of, of this uh, lockdown or confinement period mm -hmm. where everybody has had a real close look at, well, actually, let's, let's address that first. What do you think has actually been going on in the schools? Because I think, uh, in the homes, excuse me, do you think this has been more of a case of school at home? And what are your thoughts around, around that if families are worried about? Oh, yeah. One of the things, it was really interesting to me because um, when all this struck, I was, was laid up. I had sh shoulder surgery. And so I had been planning to just stay home for six weeks and recover. But, um, and that was on March 4th when I had the surgery. And within a week, the pandemic started hitting and um, everyone was locked down. And I kept seeing like almost immediately in the news, they kept saying, everyone's a homeschooler now. And it was scratching my head going, what do they mean when they say that? And then sure enough, you know, the very next night, I mean, I, you know, the late night comedians, you know, around here, they're all, you know, saying, I'm going crazy. My children are driving me crazy. I can't stand, what do I do? And then, you know, of course, a couple of days later, you start seeing the parents, you know, saying, oh, teachers are worth so much more than we pay them. I don't know how they could put up with my child, you know? And, and, you know, and it still continues that way. I mean, it's just like people are just generally annoyed and upset that their children are with them for so long. But fortunately, I think that that's just the media making hay out of it. And of course, the schools are, I mean, beating the drum like, like you wouldn't believe here in the States, at least, of, oh, all the missed learning time. Like, 
you know, oh, the summer slump. Well, they, they've been complaining about that every year. You know, children forget what they, they had over the summer, you know? And then they're, 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 they're worried about like the lost learning gains as if they'll never be able to learn this stuff again in any way, shape or form that, you know, it's just lost because they missed that window when there were seven, seven years, four months or 15 years and eight months, you know, that, that you know, that's it. You know, they're, they're never going to learn that to properly punctuate a sentence or how to speak Spanish or how to do a quadratic equation. It's like, you know, this whole idea that, that we're on this, this, this conveyor belt of learning and only the schools know how it works. And, 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 and that, you know, if you're not on that conveyor belt, you, you've missed out, you know. But of course, yeah, and, and I've seen that be, become, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, um, internalized by so many parents who feel that, you know, I, you know, I was just talking to a woman yesterday who, who said that, you know, but how will our children learn if they're not in school? Yeah, I mean, there, there's just this disbelief that, that, that children or anybody seems to learn anything unless it's taught to them explicitly in a classroom. And so now we're starting to see the emperor has no clothes on that. But at the same time, people are comfortable with that. I mean, look, the school, this is showing how much the schools provide daycare and how work fills the time allotted. It's like, oh, well, we just can't have the children sit around and play all day. We must build them up, <laughs> you know? And, and so, yeah, we've done this to the point now where, where we're obsessed with the idea that a child won't learn to read or write or even, even learn to socialize unless they're, they're put in this special situation. But fortunately, um, you know, my, my initial impression, and, and I wrote my, my first blog post in a long time, uh, because I was just so upset, you know, saying, don't let schools scare you. Children are learning all the time, you know, but th there's this, this whole idea that, you know, our children are somehow going to be deficient because they haven't been in school all this time. And yeah, of course, they're going to be deficient according to the school schedule. But again, you know, as homeschoolers, we've all learned, you know, especially unschoolers, that if you're not in school, you don't have to be in that schedule, you know, I mean, and we all know that if you're in a parochial school, you're on a different learning schedule than someone in public school and alternative schools and so on. But we forget that. We all just think that school is this, this great equalizer and that everyone's going to learn well. And if not, you, you go into special needs or remediation, you know. And that's, that's the other thing that really astounds me about the whole situation we're in is that everyone thinks that you, there's no way to catch up. Whereas we know from homeschooling, for instance, it's very common for boys to be late readers, you know, and, you know, they do, when they do learn to read, uh, it's not, it doesn't take them years, it takes them months, you know, um, I, I, we could talk more about, about this, this whole idea of catching up and, and scheduled learning, but, you know, I've already talked too much. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. It's um, this is exactly what you know we're here to do. It's like these these topics that um, the narratives that were just fed and, and mm -hmm. you know, forced to believe. And you know, it's it's tough because we've all been systemized. Uh, you know, I I went through a public schooling system. I'm I'm sure you did as well. Um, yeah. Very. This is the this is the the highest hurdle. I think this is the highest barrier to entry for anybody coming into homeschooling. Is that first that that first like uh, week to eight weeks where it is, mm -hmm. even if you've chosen to do it. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you're suddenly realize like you know it's me. <laughs> it's on me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, you don't have the excuse of the school anymore, right? Um, right. You can mm -hmm. sit at home and blame the teachers as much as you like, but um, and mm -hmm. you're off the hook if you're in uh, as well. Pat, you know something I think we we might have spoke about on our uh, original conversation mm -hmm. last year. What I've really liked about, um, you know, obviously this is a bad situation, but you know, putting everybody into homeschooling, everybody's got a chance to do it without judgment. And that, mm -hmm. has been, I think, at least, you know, if you, if people are feeling anxiety now, at least they don't have the anxiety of the judgment hanging over their heads as well. Um, mm -hmm. 
what mm-hmm. would you say to people who are seriously considering um well let's let's rephrase the question okay what are you seeing over the next 10 years what do you think is going to happen after this pandemic um what what are families going to be thinking and do you believe there's going to be uh, this huge uptick in homeschooling? I do think there's going to be an uptick in, uh, in homeschooling. I'm not sure how big it's going to be because I mean, one of the things that, that we have to accept in, in all this is that the schools are still involved in our homes. You know, I mean, in a, when they started calling it homeschooling, I was like, no, it's pandemic emergency schooling, or, you know, it's, it's, it's not real. This is not homeschooling as we know it. This is like a conscious choice that people chose. And then the other thing is, as you know, I mean, in, in homeschooling and unschooling, you, you customize it to meet your, your child's needs. You know, if they're not interested in science, there's no reason to force them to do science at the age of six or whatever, you know, you can, you know, and in fact, they're probably doing science. They don't even know it just by being outside and playing around with animals and plants and whatnot, you know, and talking to one another. But the point I want to make is <clears throat> what the schools here in the States have called it is remote learning, you know, and that I think has had a deep effect on people's perceptions of what homeschooling is in the States, because every day the teachers would, would schedule like an hour or something where everyone would be on a Zoom. And, you know, first of all, not everyone in, has a computer or a uh, internet set up, so they're already, already losing some students. And then what the schools were doing um, was just taking the stuff that they did in the classroom and piping it through the internet to people's homes and as we know that doesn't work you know i mean you know you can't you know lessons that are made for a classroom interaction can't be and you know i mean i'm a great believer in in learning by doing and i've seen it so and it works so often you know in my life and 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 from all the people have contacted me over the decades about you know how did their kids learn fractions it wasn't from a textbook it was from cooking it was from working with a measuring tape to help them build a birdhouse. You know, these are the things that, that, that the schools have got to get their heads around if they're going to try and work with people at home. But they don't. They, uh, instead, they say, take this worksheet and do this. I'll email you the, the set of problems. And then, you know, so I don't, I'm not sure they're going to be able to make that connection. I mean, I've never, I've yet to be contacted by any any educators or school system. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, probably the only ones that are, are the curriculum suppliers, the homeschoolers, you know. <clears throat> but yeah, there's a, a real um, uh, issue there with uh, learning at home is radically different than learning in the classroom. We, we knew that before the pandemic. But now with the pandemic, we have a real issue for homeschoolers and, and unschoolers in particular, which is learning is a social activity that was john holt's big insight you know that that you know we learn by by cooperating and working with one another and um by doing things um on our own it doesn't necessarily be a person it could be an object like a piano or something that, that you're interacting with but but the idea is that that we do have social contact we learn through conversation for instance but that still works because parents and siblings can have <laughs> conversations. And then, you know, I've been reading about like how in New Zealand they have the, the Corona bubbles, they call them, or, you know, they're going to let, you know, my, my family's a bubble. We'll let you in our bubble if we know that you're, and you know, homeschoolers have been doing this without the pandemic, you know, because they're like, well, you know, I, I know it's it, it's unfair and you know to say this in some way because you know you don't want to be exclusive, but you know some families you know my my child is interested in math and you know I'd like to find someone else who's interested interested in math and so you know there is a little selectivity going on and I think the pandemic is going to force us even more into that is but inviting to keep the social aspect of learning going we're going to have to figure out this idea of the social bubble and and how we bring people in because until a vaccine gets here i mean we're going to be wearing masks it's just a crazy situation when you go outdoors every time you know um you know goodness <laughs> our dogs are having such a hard time with the mask on people's face it's crazy you know <laughs> can imagine what it must be like for a young child you know i mean 
mean, it must be very disconcerting if they, they've been used to not seeing people with masks. But um, yeah, so, so the social aspect really hits homeschoolers even harder, I think, than people in school, you know, um, because in school, you know, they, they've got their six hours planned every day. You know, and most homeschoolers, you know, I want to get together and play with so-and-so. We're going to do a, a theater group or we're going to do a, a math lesson you know, or something at so, you know, somebody's house, you know. And that's another thing that um, people will probably, and I, I think like, you know, with your, your Project Galileo, you're, you're seeing this, that people are, are, are willing to try online learning. Um, but the problem is, you know, online learning still just has that whole classroom atmosphere to it. You know, there's, you know, how do we get, you know, using the things at home, like pots and pans, you know, that, that are labeled for a quart and, you know, or meter uh, liters and so on. So the children can use that, you know, um, for learning their math. Um, and they do. You know, I mean, like we say, it's survival. You want to eat, let, let's cook together. And then you, know, you, you learn that way. You know, it's not always just the direct instruction. And so figuring out how, you know, how we could do that at home. And homeschoolers have a lot of, a lot of that in their background. You know, I mean, we've, we've been doing that. I think that's the image that people have. Oh, you guys are good at just staying at home and doing this. You know, can you teach me crocheting? <laughs> you know, but actually, you know, it's actually a lot of other stuff. I mean, homeschoolers like to get out you know, and be in the community. And that's a, a, a real drawback that the pandemic is causing us. Yeah, for sure. You know, the, the amount of community groups that people, um, you know, set up around them to, to help them with their homeschooling um, is, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, it's one of those things, what, the, the myth about, you know, homeschoolers not being able to socialize. Um, <laughs> right, which, right. <laughs> which we, we busted significantly last year. Um, yeah. So, I mean, before we started recording, you, you were talking about um, a report that you were seeing some figures coming out that was just mm -hmm. like jumping off the page at you. W would you mind sharing yeah. that? Absolutely. Um, there's a website um, called Real, realclearpolitics.com. And I, I like reading it because they offer, they offer um, uh, one liberal article, one conservative article on the same topic all, all the way down. So you, you get, Get, get pretty quickly get both sides of a story. But one of the things they've been doing as they've expanded is uh, data, um, data polls. And one of their polls showed that 40% of the people surveyed said they would continue homeschooling even if the schools open. Now that to me is remarkable because I don't think there's any more than one or 2% of the population homeschooling right now, you know, or ever has been. It's always been a pretty small number. But goodness, you know, I mean, that's encouraging. But at the same time, you know, I like, I hope that it's because parents are enjoying their children and their time together and realizing that family time, social and emotional intelligence pay in spades. You know, if you work with them, with, you know, if you just work on, on you know, how to, how to be polite and, 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 and kind to other people with your children, that'll pay off in all sorts of other aspects, you know, um, including reading, writing, and math, you know. But instead, we just want to focus on reading, writing, and math, and, you know, and people forget that, you know, if they're not learned in, in, a, in a meaningful way to somebody, you're going to forget it. Just like we've all forgotten half, or if not three quarters of all the classes we've ever taken. You know, as soon as the test is over, we're out of there, you know? Yeah, 100%. And what's, um, I think the main thing people are going to be worried about is because we're in such this society of um, testing, grading, mm -hmm. certification, um, diplomas, uh, SAT scores, GCSEs, mm -hmm. A-levels, you know, whatever it is, whatever part of the world mm -hmm. that you're living in. Um, and this is one barrier again for people that like might be considering, okay, like, you know, and to your point, first of all, have I noticed the change in my, in my child's just like natural demeanor in their mood? Are they happier? Because if they are, it's a big red flag, but <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> how do we get over this, this kind of like social construct that says they've got to have a letter on their heads? Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that I, I, 
and it's not, it hasn't been talked about much, I'm glad you brought it up though, is that there's been a push to do away with standardized tests for years. I mean, ever since I started in 1981, you know, there are books like None of the Above by the New Yorker writer David Owen. You know, they're challenging the veracity of the SAT and, and showing, you know, statistically how it favors wealthy students over poor students. And that was like in the 1980s, you know, and now we're starting to see like the University of California, uh, Stanford University, and um, some other, you know, big systems are now saying they don't want the SATs. You know, they're not, you know, they're, they're actually going to start trusting what the the, the teachers are saying about the students, you know, and reading to their transcripts more and uh, recommendations, you know, and I think that that's something that that is positive, but I'm not sure how, and, and again, I'm not sure how much that has to do with the pandemic, but on the other hand, you can't take a standardized test fairly, as we know as, as unschoolers, um, if you're not prepping and studying the exact material that they're going to test you on. You know, and so that that whole construct of uh, of testing is is I think finally getting challenged. Um, you know, I mean, you you do want to do tests, you know, to see if people can do things so that you can help them do them better. That makes sense, you know. But this idea that you're going to do tests to somehow like a three hour bubble test, like the SAT is, and then somehow you're going to uncover like this this deep knowledge about their brains that that shows oh well they're not worthy for an ivy league school so send them to it they could go to a community college instead you know i mean i i really feel that 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 is changing now that 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 that, that has kind of hit its limit um and with the pandemic now that everyone's you know the whole curriculum the whole conveyor belt of, of schedule is off you know it's another reason they have to to knock these these tests off because they're all uh, you know they're all you teach to the test, you know, <laughs> and now they can't teach to the test because everyone is dispersed and out on the classroom. So I, I, I do think that, that we'll see more of a performance um, based evaluation system. I, I would like to see that. Um, but at the same time, I never doubt the powers of, of the establishment and of money that are completely tied up in keeping the status quo, you know, even though as we know, as unschoolers and homeschoolers, you get into college, you can find work worth doing uh, with non-traditional degrees. And even without a college degree, you know, if you're, you're good enough at something, you know, and persistent, people will hire you. But, um, it, you know, we, we've just got this idea of, I mean, you were talking about like the security. And I think that that's something that, that parents get, you know, they, they see this degree, they see this grade from a, a standardized test, and they say, ah, you know, so you did learn this, you can do this. Well, I, I forget where, I mean, it, it was a couple of years ago, but there was a study done uh, that said, you know, would you take the SAT again of adults? And someone like 90% of them said, absolutely no way. And like, who even remembers 80% or more <laughs> of what they had to study for these, these tests? But what we do remember, the things we use every day, you know? For me as a writer, sure, punctuation and grammar are very important. So I, I've always, you know, continue to pay attention and learn about that. And for kids, you know, it's probably, you know, the projects that they do, helping out around the house, helping out, you know, with, with uh, stuff that is meaningful to them, building with Legos um, and other things that, you know, that, that, that give them all the information that they're trying to get about, you know, how do I do this? How do I make this thing stand correctly? And then there's plenty of time to discuss like gravity and, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that, that, that have an effect on these things. You know, we don't have to just nail it all at once in the classroom, you know, because when you're learning all the time, we, we tend to pick it up in bits and pieces. And then sometimes we do the big gulp. We're ready, but only when we're ready for it, you know, but schools are like, you know, every day is a big gulp, you know. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And so, it, I mean, we, we've been definitely focusing on like um, school age. Um, I want to ask you a question about um, higher up education now and what you see panning out in the States um, with regards to college or university, as we would call it in the mm -hmm. day. Um, needs a shake up. Something's got to change. And I know 
uh, wasn't, it's not been in the news of late, but certainly at the turn of the month, um, there was um, a lady at Harvard who was very vociferous about um, mm -hmm. homeschoolers. And yes. could you speak to a, a little bit about like what, what happened there and, and where you see yes. like, the future of, of college? Yeah. Well, um, they're actually slightly unrelated, but um, yeah, the, the lady was uh, the director of Harvard's law school's child advocacy program. I think her name is um, pronounced Bartholay, um, Elizabeth Bartholay or Bartholette. I'm not, not really sure how you pronounce it. But um, she'd written a thing in Harvard's alumni magazine calling for the banning of homeschooling. And um, she uh, is largely basing it on uh, abuse of children. Um, and she cited the book um, Educated by Tara Westover as evidence of that. And um, yeah, she's persisting on it. Um, you know, there, you know, she was just recently re-interviewed um, by Harvard Magazine on, on that issue. And she doubled down, you know, she really feels that you know, homeschooling is a disservice to, to children um, and that most parents are, are just not capable of doing it. And, um, you know, things like alternatives to education and alternative schooling and stuff just aren't worth it. You know, that, you know, as far as she's concerned, um, it, you know, it's the conventional school that um, we, we have to follow, you know, and that we're doing our children a grave disservice by not doing that. And um, I haven't listened to it yet, but uh, Blake Bowles, uh, who's written a, a number of books about uh, homeschooling and unschooling in particular, uh, has interviewed her. Um, I, I haven't listened to the podcast yet. He just emailed me this, I think, on Monday. Um, today is Wednesday, I think. So uh, I haven't listened to her interview with him, but um, it'd be interesting. So if you're, you're, you want to learn like the, the, the latest thoughts <laughs> by, by her about this, but yeah, it's kind of surprising that at time, you know, I mean, she had no choice in the timing of the pandemic, of course, when she, when she wrote the article. But my friends who um, are, are lawyers and researchers who have read the, the article in the footnotes have spent a lot of problems with it. And I just, you know, I, I mean, I just have a general problem with the overall idea that we shouldn't have any alternatives to school and that all kids must be forced to go to public schooling, um, you know, because otherwise they could be abused at home. And I'm like, there's just as much abuse, if not more going on in the institution of school as, you know, the Catholic church scandals and other things have shown. And as we, we know from, you know, what happens in inner city schools. And I mean, you know, story after story comes out, book after book about, you know, how, how poor, how poorly treated the, this population is uh, in school. Um, so I don't, I don't know why why she's she's you know dug in her heels uh, on this, but it's not unusual. You know, um, we've seen. I mean, we were fighting about uh, against this these, these sorts of objections to homeschooling back in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, but I think as a result of it getting popular. You know, even though the book Educated, which, by the way, I think is excellent. I mean, I, I know a lot of homeschoolers only want to bring it up because it, it, it's, you know, I mean, look, she's abused by her family. Absolutely. But as she points out, her father and her brother were both suffer from mental illness. And they were, you know, really, you know, running the family, you know, down. And uh, two of her brothers left the family before she did, you know, as a result of this. So to, to lay all the, you know, to, to use that as the prime example of why we should ban homeschooling is wrong. And in interviews I've heard Tara Westover give on the radio, at least, she's never said ban homeschooling. In fact, she mentions that in the book that two of her brothers are successfully homeschooling their children. You know, whatever that means, I mean, that's all she says about it. But she's clearly not like trying to knock homeschooling, but, um, you know, it's, so so I think that we have to be a, a, a little a little more um, circumspect about what that book means, and also, you know, the idea that everyone is is a child abuser, particularly parents. I mean, this is this is just crazy, you know. Um, and and yeah, you know, the idea that we are somehow abusing our children by not following a standard curriculum. I mean, where where does that logic 
take us. You know, I mean, it 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 it, it just just goes down down a whole bunch of you know paths of you know it's almost like an episode of Black Mirror. If you want to start following, you know, you know. well, you're you can't be trusted to raise your children. So when they're two, we take them into a special child care, blah blah blah, and scientifically and educationally approved and designed education is the only way to go. You know, I mean, this idea that we live and learn is just so lost in, 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 in these discussions, you know, and, and what are parents to do then? Are we, are we simply to, you know, earn money to pay for people to raise our children and, you know, then to feed them and make sure they do their homework and then put them to bed? Is that it? I mean, that's, that seems to be, I mean, I know a lot of families do that, you know, but they're not particularly happy. And, you know, when they tend to, well, as you wrote in your book, Choose Life, you know, so, you know, when you choose to get off that, that conveyor belt off the, the, uh, the rat race, you suddenly find that you have a lot of other options out there. Now, travel is severely curtailed at the moment, you know, so, so that's it. But at the same time, we're lucky to have these communication things. So, you know, you're in France, I'm in Boston, and, and here we are. And same thing with our children, you know, we could set these things up. Um, I would love to see more um, uh, products that children can use to socialize, you know, but they're always, I don't know, so, so many of them, like the, all the good games and stuff, you know, they often get ruined by, by like all these in-game purchases and all this you know, pressure from uh, outside forces to upgrade and do this. And, you know, so I, I have mixed feelings about how corporate America or, or corporates in, in Europe is going to handle all this stuff. But um, I do think that that certainly for the coming year, until a vaccine or something comes around, we're all going to be relying on this technology. And I think children should be included in it. You know, we're not, we're not really ma making a lot of space for them. You know, we're just, again, just giving them what they've always gotten in the past, which is sit down, shut up, and do as I say, you know, and, and then I'll let you play with the computer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's a good point. And this year, at this year's summit, we're having a whole ed tech section where we're going to be interviewing um, founders and CEOs of um, technological com technology companies that are building online schools, you know, such as Galileo mm. um, and Sora schools and Lambda school, um, Prenda, they're all coming on and we're all going to have a um, big discussion. And we have an investors coming on as well to talk about uh, what's going on in this space because, mm -hmm. you know, we feel this fundamental shift. There's going to be a paradigm change and it's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to yeah. ask you, like if we flip the coin, so we've been talking about mm -hmm. the kids um, but let's like, think about the teachers and the opportunity right. now gives the teachers to release the teachers from the system, which I believe they're just as, right. as, as the kids. Um, mm -hmm. They can now mm -hmm. go remote. They can go freelance. They can teach the specific subject that they truly want to teach to kids that are truly interested in it because they're the only ones that are turning up on the Zoom calls or whatever. Right. And, <laughs> and they get to teach it how they want to, not Right. Spoon for the curriculum. What are your What are your thoughts about that? Have you heard any like teachers um, talking about, you know, their um, opportunities? Not, not, no. Most of the teachers that I and my my wife is a teacher. She works. Uh, she's a director, um, a coordinator for special education for a public school system here in Boston. They're all just trying to figure out how how they're going to like do school. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's still that's still the big thing. You know, they're going to have half as many kids in the classroom and stuff like that. You know, there, there's not really this forward looking thing because, I mean, look, they have to work with the budgets that they have and they have thousands of children that they have to deal with now, you know. Um, and so it's I, I understand it, but I do think that they're missing some opportunities here by not thinking broader. I mean, one of the things that, that kind of surprises me is how like they dig in like, oh, you know, you know, we're going to lose our jobs, you know, in this. And it's like, no, actually, if we open up school to outside of school, we're going to need more teachers because smaller classes are vital. So we need more teachers to, to fill in smaller classes. And then we also need different types of teachers. You know, um, you know, some, I mean, kids learn, you know, who want to learn, I, I used crocheting earlier, I don't know why, but just to use that example again, they want to learn to crochet. You know, I mean, look, there's math, 
there's history, there's fashion and design, there's a whole bunch of, of it, it, you know, we have to gain this interdisciplinary concept, you know, regain it. I mean, there's a lot of talk, particularly in higher ed, about interdisciplinary studies, but the fact is there's still steel doors between the English department and the science department and the history department, you know. Once a semester, they do, they do a day you know, where they all get together and talk about, you know, how they interact. But, you know, it could be a lot better. And I think that that's, that's what happens at the very small level where like, you know, someone's teaching crochet and a child might say, what, you know, what's, you know, what's this cap? Well, why are we making it this way? You say, well, in Holland, they, they, they like this design and they do that. Oh, where's Holland? You know, one thing leads to another. Is it, you know, this interrelationship of knowledge that we forget that school just, gives us this beeline like science you know here's your, your your 12 years of study for science so this would be a great opportunity for teachers to actually work with children in a, a more free-form way and then there's always going to be and this is why i say different types of teachers because then there's always going to be a need for like a good lecturer or someone who has that broad knowledge to connect like the you know the caveman technology to nuclear science you know it could give that 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 history to people who want it, you know? I mean, you know, you want willing students. So, you know, the first types of teachers would be the ones that sort of get people interested and um, in, enthusiastic about a topic and, and teach them the skills and stuff. But then when you need like the next level of knowledge, you know, maybe that that's where it becomes more of a formal sit down lecture thing. Or it could be, I hope, like perhaps even more of a tutorial thing where it's, it's like more like a, a graduate school seminar. And again, we need more teachers to do this. You know, you got five, 10 students tops sitting around talking in depth about uh, a topic. Now, I could easily see that exciting like uh, high school and uh, middle school you know, kids as well as college kids, you know. Um, so that, I, I really do think that, that there's a great opportunity and it just may happen because if more people decide to homeschool there will be more I mean I'm familiar and it sounds like through the Galileo project you are too with teachers who are fed up with school teaching but who want to continue teaching and so they find homeschoolers or you know these other opportunities where they could could work outside of you know in a, like a um, um, I, I can't think of the, the, the word again, but it's just like, you know, I know like there used to be like science stores, you know, and, um, you know, you could buy science projects and equipment there or the learning tree store where you could buy educational products, you know, and then, but then they could put you in touch with your local person, you know, or people, you know, who could do these things and work with you. And again, like I said, if, if you know, you got your bubble, you know, you're, you're comfortable. This is someone who lives in your neighborhood and, you know, they've had COVID or not and, and so on. You can invite them into your home, you know, maybe allow your children to go to go meet with them in a park or, you know, I mean, that's a common thing that you know, we've been doing as unschoolers for years just to get together in the park. You know? <laughs> yeah. What a weird concept. Um, I know. Right now, that's probably one of the safest places to be, right? Be outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> so pat where um i think now with with where we're at loads of people looking for um resources of um you know where to start learning about it and you obviously have one of the best resources out there uh with john's books which um i urge anybody to go and, and check out could you um just let people know where they can come and find you and uh which books they should probably start mm -hmm. with if if you would directing complete you know you certainly know. certainly thanks well the, right now um i'm in the pro i'm almost done revising the what the website right now but it's www.johnholtgws.com john holt was the author uh and teacher and he started the magazine growing without school gws his first book was called how children fail it's um about his experiences teaching in the classroom um, his second book, How Children Learn, that's the one that I would recommend if you wanted to get started because he wrote that, that you know, to show the positive side. How Children Fail is about how children, are, you know, run away from learning. <laughs> or as, uh, to paraphrase Shaw, you know, education chasing after a child instead of a child chasing after education, you know. Um, 
but how children learn, he, he really like zeroed in on how does a child learn before they go to school? And, and that book um, was revised in, in the 80s in the light of his experience with homeschoolers. And he added a whole chapter about play and fantasy play in particular and how important that is uh, for children's learning. Um, and that was based on his experiences working with homeschoolers over the years. And that book has just celebrated its 50th, well, not just, in 2017, it celebrated its 50th year in continuous print. That book and How Children Learn have been in print, I mean, fail, have been in print continuously since it first came out. So How Children Learn is, is a good one. And if you have very young children, or if you're not into reading a, a whole book, you just want to read like snippets, I really recommend learning all the time. Um, it's very short. Uh, it's a lot of stories from the early issues of Growing Without Schooling that John collected and used to illustrate how children are learning all the time. How small children, it's basically about um, small children uh, and how they learn to read, write, and calculate without being taught. Um, you know, and, and for anyone who, who just wants to get their head around that idea, um, I, I think learning all the time is a really good spot to start. Perfect. Well, um, Pat, thank you so much for your time this year again. And uh, I don't know if you remember the answer to my closing question last year, but I'm going to give you the same question and we'll see if you do. <laughs> if, you could, <laughs> if you could have one person come out and talk about homeschooling in, uh, in a positive manner and um, help educate people around like the, the power behind it, who would that person be and why? Hmm. Well, I, I probably said John Holt last year, so, uh, <laughs> and I still think that, you know, he's probably the, the best at explaining these things, but um, I don't know. I mean, to, to, to really just kind of, kind of kick it out there, I, I would like to see, I would love to see someone like Benjamin Franklin, if they could come back and just talk about, because there were no public schools back then, you know? How did he learn? Tell us about, about how you became Benjamin Franklin. How did you come up? I mean, basically any of the colonialist you know, founders of America I think would, would have some, something of import to say about the idea of, of education. You know, I mean, John Quincy Adams uh, was taught by, by his father, John Adams, and he became a president of the United States, you know. But, you know, he didn't spend much time or any time in school that I know of. So it'd be, I think it'd be really fascinating to hear from those people, you know, um, if we could. <laughs> yeah, that's a great answer. And do you want to know who you said last year? Who? Will Smith. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> and I, yeah, and, and he would be a great example. Again, like, you know, uh, someone who's current, you know, uh, yeah, that's, that's right. I forgot about that. The Fresh Prince himself. Well, that's uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great. It's been great as always talking with you and uh, really appreciate your time today. And um, yeah, thanks for the work you've done over the decades and uh, exciting decade ahead for you, I'm sure, because, you know, change is afoot. Yes, it is. It is. Well, thanks for inviting me to talk with you again, Daniel, and I look forward to doing it again. Thanks, Pat. Take care. You too. Bye.